One of the topics people are the most interested in regarding Chinese medicine is Chinese medical dietetics, or really using food as medicine. And we've discussed in other videos here how in ancient times, one of our most ancient texts discusses this idea of food grade therapy versus basically medical grade, if I could term it that. But effectively how there are certain substances, plants, animals, minerals that we use medically some are considered upper level medicinals, meaning they have a less strong effect on physiology and are used generally speaking for more mild illness. Some are in the food grade category, which may actually be foods. And then we have lower level medicinals and those are, let's just say strongly therapeutic, meaning they exert a strong influence on your physiology. They're required to treat serious illnesses, but you don't want to take them long-term due to the fact that they are a strong intervention, right? It's like taking a Xanax. Okay, every now and then, but you don't want to take it every night to sleep. That's going to be a very dangerous and prolonged recovery to sleep naturally again. So let's discuss the basics of Chinese medical dietetics in this video. Hey guys, Dr. Alex Hine, author of the health book, Master of the Day, Chinese medicine doctor. Now, before we jump into this video, two very important links right below. The first is for this free guide, five daily rituals that could potentially help you add years to your life with traditional Chinese medicine. And the second is if you want to become a patient of mine locally or online via telemedicine, the contact info for my private practice is right below this video in California. Now, the first important piece of understanding dietetics is understanding constitution. Because in Chinese medicine, when we're talking about food, obviously the same diet does not work well for everyone. You have some people who drink coffee every day, no problem, no digestive upset. And you have some people who drink coffee twice a week and they already get indigestion, acid reflux, and their digestion has a lot of problems or they have stomach pain. So in the same vein, some people can eat wheat every day, no problem. Others cannot eat it once a week. Now, when we talk about constitution, we have to understand that, first of all, there are certain constitutions that run in families, right? Susceptibilities to food or even outright diseases like celiac disease. And on top of that, there are just general certain body types. Some families, like in my side, my maternal side, they're usually very thin, very wiry, kind of energetic people uh, with poor digestion, digestive problems, and asthma and allergies. So understanding that as a constitutional susceptibility or weakness, or maybe a better word is tendency, means that that family needs to keep in mind certain dietary pieces of advice and lifestyle advice to minimize the problems that that constitution can have, right? So a person with allergies and phlegminess in their throat probably should avoid dairy, for example, because it's gonna exacerbate that kind of phlegm and mucus in the mucus membranes. General pieces of advice like that are useful to understand constitutionally. Now, maybe if your family is Scandinavian or Eastern European, you consume a lot of dairy, no problem. It's probably not a big deal for you. But understanding the general idea of constitution, what is your body type? Do you run more cold? Do you run more hot? Are your bowel movements more soft? Are they more overly hard? Do you have a pale face? Or are you more prone to a red face? Do you easily put on weight or do you easily lose weight? All of these are factors we can use to gauge constitution. But today we'll talk about a very simple one because we're gonna be talking about the herb ginger and it's very important for a lot of constitutions, but I would say mostly what we call the cold deficient or wetter dampness prone constitution. Now, the second thing we need to understand when it comes to Chinese medical dietetics is what's called flavor and nature of herbs or foods. Now, the flavor and nature is an ancient concept where these ancient peoples and ancient doctors were trying to understand how do you categorize medicinal substances in the absence of modern chemistry? How do you? I mean, you could put them in your mouth and try them. For some people, that will kill them. <laughs> Mushrooms, a lot of herbs we use in Chinese medicine are toxic, unprocessed. You know, we use a lot of aconite. And I think one gram of aconite unprocessed will kill you. So how do you use potentially 100 grams in a day processed? How do you learn that through trial and error? Uh, you can imagine what the early history of Chinese medicine probably looked like with aconite poisoning. But the general idea of flavor and nature are to generalize the flavor and nature of the herb or what we consider the temperature and the flavor. So ginger is warm and the flavor is spicy right? Spicy, almost everyone can tell if they put it in their mouth, and it's considered warming. When we talk about this idea of flavor in nature, warm or acrid, this, this flavor in our ancient medical texts is something that creates movement. 
right? You have a little bit of indigestion, you have some ginger, you have a lot of ginger, you'll create burping, and then it's going to increase metabolism. It increases movement. And that's very important to understand because that is one of the differentiations between warming and cooling medicinals, right? One of the things we're trying to focus on is does this generate movement or does it slow down movement? Does it move? Does it astringe? And everything in between. So let's give the example of somebody who's prone to low appetite, bloating, and a food baby after eating. The flavor of sweet, whether that sweet is licorice, that sweet is a sugar, that sweet is eating two mangoes after dinner, sweet generates fluids and dampness in Chinese medicine. So if you're experiencing a lot of bloating, the flavor of sweet is not necessarily something you should have. So have you ever had the experience of drinking a very sweet drink and afterwards <clears throat> you're like <clears throat> clearing your throat all the time? That sugar generates this kind of this mucus. And so people that are prone to that to begin with, there are a lot of people with digestive problems like myself who are prone to that flemminess, even if they eat healthy, should avoid that flavor of sweet and should introduce more spicy acrid like ginger because that generates movement and will move some of that mucus and some of those fluids. So fundamentally, thinking of it almost like cooking is very important, I think. One of my first herbal mentors who, who I learned from in school described that food-grade herbalism and food-grade medicine is how you cook, right? And it doesn't mean just cooking healthy. It means understanding your own constitution, where if you are like the aforementioned phlegmy, dampness-prone kind of person in Chinese medicine, the mucous membranes are a little bit damp like me, you know, a lot of phlegm in the throat, maybe sinus problems or lung problems like asthma, then you want to introduce potentially more acrid, spicy, fragrant herbs. Peppers, gingers, uh, garlic, cinnamon. These will help create more movement so the mucosa are not quite as damp. But if you're someone who's a little bit dry, those may be contraindicated. Those may not be good foods for you. Uh, that may not be good food therapy or you know Chinese medical dietetic principles. So understanding where am I on the spectrum of more damp, more wet, more cold, to more dry, maybe more heat in the face, more dry stools, then maybe you need more vegetables in your diet and more rice and less strong spicy flavors. These are, you know, understanding constitution is where is my default genetic template? Then understanding food, flavor and nature of food, more warming, more cooling, more spicy, sweet, sour, bitter, we're going to go into all of these a lot more in the future. Where I am, right? Where am I on the spectrum? Where the food is? Where is the food on the spectrum? And then from there, creating much more targeted kind of daily food therapy towards whatever your goals are, or whatever your current pathology is. And again, we can go a lot of different directions with these videos, but we'll talk more in the future about specific foods, how you can use them, specific constitutions, at least the main predispositions that I see and certain basic pieces of dietary advice that can help. But for now, so this video is not too long, the most important is your constitution and then the flavor and the nature of the food. Specifically, if you're adding uh, medicinal food grade products like ginger, for example, into your food, understanding where you are in that spectrum is important. So that is all I have for today's video. Again, if you'd like to stay in touch, download the free guide below this video. If you'd like to become a patient in my practice in Los Angeles, there's a contact info for my private practice right below this video.